Welcome to the DevNet Zone, day three, guys. All right, cool. Um, one second here. So uh, welcome to Coding 101. My name is Matt DiNapoli. Uh, we're going to give a little introduction about APIs. We're going to do some exercises. If you have your laptops and you want to follow along, I actually uh, have a WebEx open. So if you head over to that WebEx, let me make sure that's right. Yeah. Uh, you can jump in that room. I'm sharing on that particular uh, URL. And then I can paste and um, send you guys the links that you can uh, use while we're walking along. So um, I'm going to get started. The first part of this is just going to be me talking about APIs, how you use them, how you format URLs, and all that fun stuff. And then we'll actually do a, a demo at the end that you can follow along with. <coughs> cool? Cool. Excuse me, I am a... <laughs> I am a little sick here, so uh, forgive me if I have to take a break and take some water. Um, so here's what we're going to do. Uh, we're going to talk about why you need to learn about REST APIs, um, and then we're going to talk about REST uh, Web API basics. Don't be scared. This stuff is actually pretty easy once someone kind of gives it to you. And I think we do a pretty good job about talking about uh, APIs and how to use them and what they're used for. Um, we'll actually dig in, into the anatomy of a REST API, um, the different parts and pieces you need to get it right, um, how to, to look into API documentation, figure out how to use one. Um, and then we'll do hands-on uh, with Cisco Spark. And then we'll talk about some next steps. <clears throat> uh, first off, who's coding 101 for? Um, it could be for brand new coders. Um, if you don't know anything about APIs, you don't know anything about coding, you're in the right place. That's great. Uh, for returning coders, now for me, I've been a, a software developer my entire career. Um, and uh, when I got introduced to REST APIs, they were relatively new to me. I had to do a little research, but um, I found them very easy to grasp. So I hope that at the end of this, you guys will see that uh, they're not too hard. They're not very intimidating. Um, could be appropriate for NetOps. Um, you might not necessarily use them, but it helps to know what your developers might be doing. Um, or how you could uh, leverage APIs to make your job easier. Uh, a lot of what we talk about in the DevNet zone is network programmability, and APIs come into play there. A lot of the things that you might have done <coughs> in the past uh, with uh, the CLI, uh, the way the platforms are being built now, you might be able to automate those tasks uh, using APIs, save yourselves um, hours, if not days of work, uh, through the usage of APIs. And then finally, DevOps. Uh, if you're not familiar with the term DevOps, um, it's not a wholly new term, uh, but it is the idea of uh, the soup to nuts um, process of going through um, creating an application and deploying it into uh, production. So that's kind of the DevOps process. And it's, um, it's a methodology that developers and teams of developers are um, adopting so that they can get applications out the door and uh, be able to make changes relatively quickly. Um, you might hear some discussions about containers and microservices over the course of the next few days. And DevOps really plays uh, heavily into that because uh, production applications are getting changed um, sometimes hundreds of times, of, uh, hundreds of times in a day. Um, and uh, DevOps plays, or how that DevOps framework is set up plays mainly into the ability to do that without uh, breaking production code. Oh, I went the wrong way. Um, if you want to code along, um, I'll be using a, a tool. It's, a, it's called a REST client. Um, this particular one that we like to use in the DevNet zone is called Postman. Um, you can get that at www.getpostman.com. Um, I will actually. <coughs> Put that in the chat for this particular thing. Um, <coughs> so if you guys want to grab that, you can grab that tool. <coughs> we also have um, our learning labs. So a lot of what I'm going to talk about is covered at uh, learninglabs.cisco.com. And all of, those, all of the learning labs are available um, all the time. <clears throat> uh, 
Did I put that in? OK. Uh, they're, they're available all the time at home. You can access them from your laptops. Uh, but if you want to play around with them here, we have uh, 20 kiosks set up over there by the train. Um, those are f uh, specifically for the learning labs. Um, we have, um, I think, somewhere in the neighborhood of uh, 80. Uh, let me take this down here. Uh, 80 or so different um, learning labs. Uh, coding, one, uh, coding 101, Coding 102, um, those will introduce you to the REST API. So anything that I talk about here, if you, wanna, if you just want to listen to me and then uh, do that stuff later, they're over there. Um, once we get into Coding 200s, uh, we'll actually be working with Python, um, applying the API uh, discussion that we were talking about here, and then uh, actually writing some code to see how that works. And then we actually get into some product-specific uh, learning labs. So it'll walk you through step-by-step um, in tutorial type fashion in the learning labs. So uh, I would highly suggest you check those out if you're interested in, in getting up to speed on um, all of this network programmability, cloud capability, cloud collaboration, all of that stuff is covered in the learning labs. Cool. So we have that. All right, so <laughs> a lot of that was administration. Let's get, the, uh, let's get this going. So wh uh, what is an API? API stands for Application Programming Interface. APIs uh, have been around forever. It essentially allows two systems to talk to each other. Um, you think about it, you interact with your computer uh, through the keyboard, using the mouse. Computers, uh, servers, uh, uh, cloud services, they all need to interact with each other in some way, shape, or form or, as well. We do that through the API. Um, now, we're going to be specifically talking about REST APIs, um, but uh, there have been a number of APIs that have been around in general. And it usually requires, and this is the definition of an API, some definition that one system is going to apply to talk to another. And uh, there are a certain set of rules and capabilities that one service is going to provide to another. So that's what an API essentially is. Pretty, pretty base concept. <coughs> So the common types of APIs, I believe we will only be covering REST APIs in the DevNet zone. Those are the reason being they're very easy to understand, they're very easy to consume, um, and a lot of our platforms support REST. Uh, it's used over HTTP, so it's the same protocol that we use to access web pages. Um, so, but instead of bringing up HTML, it might give back, well, it might give back HTML. But uh, it might give back data in another format. It could be XML, or uh, the, the format that we're going to be looking at is called JSON. So um, it's just a data structure, nothing to get scared about. You hear a lot of acronyms and all that stuff. JSON is just the data structure. And we'll take a look at that a little bit. It's not the core concept of this class. Um, I believe the next one, 102, will cover JSON a little more deeply. Um, there are, it's going out of vogue, but uh, the uh, API type uh, called SOAP, the Simple Object Access Protocol. You can do it, uh, uh, you can use it to communicate over HTTP, TCP, a number of different protocols, but <coughs> uh, there's a lot of overhead that goes into it. Uh, you have to package up the message in a certain specific way. Um, one side of the API has to have a service definition that, um, if you make some changes to the API, it's harder to consume. Uh, REST has become uh, more popular because it is easier to use. Um, and then there, depending on the service, there might be language-specific APIs, and then SDKs, uh, software development kits, that are built on top of those APIs. So you might see or hear about the Java API or a Python API or a C API. Um, and it could be that that service or uh, that application um, just runs better in C, so the API itself will be built in that, and uh, the consuming application then would have to uh, be built in C so they could talk to each other. So, but as you can see, those are generally more specialized. Uh, the idea behind REST is it, is it can be, I think this moves to the next one, it can be consumed from a lot of different platforms <coughs> because it's HTTP. Any device that we, or not any device, but most devices that we use allow for the HTTP protocol, our mobile devices, our laptops, all that stuff, our servers. And so that's what's great about REST. Um, they're easy to use in all of those different platforms.
So in this example, uh, we're looking at the we're we're looking at the GitHub uh, REST APIs. Uh, GitHub, if you guys are not familiar, is uh, essentially a code repository. It's very popular among um, developers. Uh, that DevOps crew that I was talking about before, they love GitHub. Um, Git is a um, code versioning protocol, and GitHub is a public uh, offering for that. So, but GitHub provides APIs. So if you're um, working on a DevOps team, you might do something like, um, uh, say, like Spark or messaging app. If someone checks in new code, you might have use those REST APIs in GitHub to send a message to Spark to say, hey, a new code version has been checked in. Uh, so that the team knows what's going on. Oh, and then there we have Spark. You can see it's the same model. <coughs> um, instead of it being GitHub, the application now is Cisco Spark. And the, actually, Spark's going to be the application in this particular class that we look at for REST APIs. Now, don't worry about too much what Cisco Spark is. I'm, you guys probably already know it's a, um, you know, our messaging, persistent messaging application. Um, but in coding 102, uh, uh, my colleague Brett Tiller is going to go over APIC-EM APIs. But you'll see a pattern. Um, you'll see that these APIs follow the same concepts. And then, hence, APIC-EM as well. So you see this. All we're doing is replacing the service in each instance. And those APIs are being consumed by different devices, different servers, uh, things like that. <coughs> so how does it work? Um, essentially, your client. Could be your laptop, could be your mobile device. Um, it makes a request against an API service. We don't really care what that API service is for the uh, point of this discussion. Like I said, it could be GitHub, it could be Spark, it could be a weather service from um, uh, the, Nas the US National Weather Service. Sorry, that's a bad example here. But, um, uh, and then there are methods that are supported for those particular calls. Um, REST APIs support, um, could be a number of different ones, but the four most important are GET, post, put, and delete. Uh, get is I'm grabbing information from the service, um, essentially making a, a query to that service. Um, post is, uh, for usual purposes, if the API is designed properly, uh, will be creating a new record in that service. And we'll actually see that when we go through our demo. Put uh, is usually updating a record. Sometimes put and post are used interchangeably. So if you are looking at API documentation and it says to create a record, Use a put. Actually, <laughs> if you come to the CMX class at 11 o'clock, uh, you'll see that is one instance where that ch is changed. Uh, but put is usually uh, used to do an update rather than create a new record. And then uh, finally, delete is self-explanatory. You're going to get rid of that particular record that you're asking for. So the API service then does something. Um, we don't necessarily know what that is. It's potentially a black box. If the API is good, if it's documented well, you don't care what it's doing. You just want something back and as quickly as possible. Um, so we're assuming that the API is trustworthy. It's going to do something, and it's going to send back a response. <coughs> like I said before, that response is going to be data in some form or fashion. Could be XML, could be JSON. Um, but it's going to send that, that response back. And the documentation for that API will tell you how that um, response is going to come back, so that then the application, the client, knows how to consume that information. So that's how the that's the general format of how a uh, uh, REST API works. So pretty pretty straightforward, right? Cool. I don't think do we have questions? Like if people have have questions, okay. So if you have questions, just raise your hand. Paul, walk around with a mic. Um, so, but are there any questions? No? OK, great. Excuse me? Um, so this is a REST request. Um, what do you need to know? So the first part of this, this is um, the Google Maps API. Uh, the server itself is maps.googleapis.com. Um, and this, this invariably will always be the case. You, are, you have a server that is providing the service. Um, and that will be well defined. And that usually will not change from version to version. <coughs> Uh, this particular U, uh, API doesn't seem to have versioning in it. Uh, we will look at, <coughs> excuse me, when we will look at Spark, we'll see um, some versioning information for the API that'll help you determine whether or not you're using the right version of it. Um, and then we have the resource endpoints. Um, in this particular instance, we have maps, 
API geocode JSON. Um, so uh, what it looks like we're asking for is map information, giving us back geocode information that Google manages in a JSON format. And then we're sending a query parameter. Um, and it's always notated with a question mark. Um, and then we're asking specifically for the address equal to the city name San Jose. Um, query parameters, uh, depending on how the API is set up, uh, you could send a number of them. Um, this one takes this one. Um, and I'm guessing that there are other ones that are available to it. And if you have a bunch of them, um, it would be then ampersand and then the next query parameter. Um, so that's the URI. And there are a lot of parts and pieces of that URI already, right? So then we have the client request. Or I'm sorry, the header, that part of it. Um, depending on the API, and again, this is all found in the documentation. And you're going to hear me talk about the documentation a lot because the documentation is so important. Um, good API documentation cannot be stressed enough. And you will find that as you start working with APIs, if the documentation is not good, you will be frustrated. <laughs> um, so uh, fortunately, the Spark API, I would say, that is very well documented. And I'll show you guys that when we do the example. But um, I know because the documentation for this particular API is good, the Maps API, I know that I need to send a content type header. Um, and then I need to send some authorization. Um, and it'll tell me how I create that API key in the documentation as well. Um, and then, as I mentioned, our actions before, we have get, which retrieves data, um, post, which will create a new record, could be put, update a record, and then delete if we want to remove it. Uh, Paul, we have a question over here. Use SSL? What's that? Are you able to use SSL for added security? Yes, yeah. Um, most, I would actually be wary of APIs that don't use SSL. So good question. Any others? OK. Um, and we will t actually, um, I think, it's, I think it, it's today at maybe 11 o'clock, I do uh, talk about API um, security. So we can talk about that then. So after you make that API call, something comes back. We get our data, potentially. Uh, but we also get a status code. And this status code is kind of important when you're writing an application. Because uh, depending on the code you get back, you have to make a decision in that application. Um, so uh, if you get a 200 OK, that's great. That's what you want to happen. Um, ideally, if the API is, is well formed and designed well, um, 200 OK will only come back <laughs> in instances that everything is properly done. Um, I've used some APIs. I've actually actively using some APIs that um, give us a 200 OK no matter what. And then in um, the information that's coming back, they then tell me the error. That makes things a little bit challenging. Ideally, <laughs> ideally we will get um, a 400 error if there is a problem with the way you've made the API call. Um, and it's usually, if it's a 400 series, it's something that you've done wrong. So if you get a 400, um, the request might be invalid. You've, you've um, well, I should say you or your application has formatted the URL wrong. Um, or uh, the query parameter is uh, not correct, not set to a valid value. Um, 401 is always uh, you are not authorized to use this, and that could be the credentials are bad or missing, or those particular credentials aren't allowed to do what you're asking it to do. Um, 403 is uh, the request is understood, uh, but the service is saying you're not, al not allowed to do this. And then if it's a 500 series, that's, that's a little more challenging. Um, for APIs that are well done, 400s are usually easily fixable because you'll get a message back from the API saying, uh, you've done this wrong, fix this, and then you do it, and then you get a 200. Um, 500s are kind of black box errors. If the service is really good, it'll tell you why, and then you can decide whether or not to bother making that API call again. Uh, but a lot of times, it'll just say 500 error. And so hopefully, uh, there will be a support person on the other line saying, hey, we're down, or you know, the database is messed up, or something like that. But 500 is usually not your problem or your application's problem. And you have to, but you do have to handle for it. So if you're writing an application, um, you consider a scenario where you do one process for a 200 OK, you do another process for a 400 series, and you do a third process for a 500. 
so that if it's a user-facing application or even a process that you're um, running in the back end, that you can uh, handle all of those properly and recover properly depending on if the API is available or not. Um, and then I mentioned, and I can't hammer this home, home enough, um, all of the data will come back in some format. And we'll look specifically at JSON, but it could be something else like XML or text. So let's talk about JSON versus XML. That's a little small. I don't really like that uh, particular. Let's see if we can run this API. <coughs> see if we can run this API so we can look at it a little more closely. <coughs> so I just uh, ran this API. I just ran it in a browser. Um, I talked about authorization authentication. This is a, a very public API. It allows me to pull that data pretty quickly. Um, can you guys see that okay? Yeah? Okay, great. Um, this is JSON, all right? It's just a data format. It's actually really easy to read. Um, the structure of it is very hierarchical. Um, so if you are in a situation where you're parsing this data, it parses very nicely in Python and other programming languages. A lot of our coding examples go through parsing in Python. Um, in, Pretty cool how easy it is. You just create a JSON object and then pull the data out as it's set. Um, but you can see that there are address components in this particular result. And it has um, a number of objects. Um, so I guess if, if we give for San Jose, uh, we get address components for San Jose, Santa Clara County, California. Um, but we notice that each thing, um, each address component has uh, values to it, um, a name value pair, long name is San Jose, short name is San Jose, and then the types, um, and then that types uh, object is a list of um, descriptors about that particular space. So this is what that API provides back to us. Now if we wanted XML, and I'm, I'm going on a whim here because I don't think I've actually tried this one before. I'm guessing if I go XML on this one, yes, all right. So it's the same endpoint API. Same data, it's just formatted differently. It's XML, uh, you guys are probably familiar with XML. It's been around forever. And um, so, just different data format. If you're more comfortable working in XML and the API allows for it, go ahead and use XML. If you're more comfortable working in JSON, um, I would recommend that. It actually seems to be a little bit easier to uh, process than XML. There's not, you can see there's not as much overhead to, um, to JSON as there is XML. So that was that example. Any questions between the difference of the data formats coming back on the API? No. All right, great. Am I going too fast? No? OK. We have a lot to cover, which is why I want to make sure. Um, So I talked about the documentation. Then the answer to this question, where do you find the information needed for the request, is the documentation. Again, I cannot stress enough. I've already said this. The documentation needs to be good for an API to be useful. So um, let's actually jump into a hands-on with Postman. I want to make sure that I cover all this. So I talked about GitHub earlier. Um, if you are, are starting to work with uh, network programmability, um, DevOps, all of the things we kind of promote in the DevNet zone, uh, we also provide a number of repositories in uh, GitHub on, under Cisco DevNet. And I'll actually pop this URL in so you guys can head there and check it out. <coughs> So um, you can see there are different ones. We have, uh, let me make this bigger so you can all see it. Uh, we have code samples for Spark API. We have events called DevNet Express events where you, it's a couple day intensive program where we go through a lot of the stuff that we're covering here. Um, open daylight samples, uh, the train labs up there. Uh, so a bunch of different things that fit in with this whole idea of uh, network programmability and cloud collaboration are in that space. Um, 
Sorry, I'm jumping back and forth between some things because I want to make sure that I cover it all. So we have GitHub, and then there's, so there's an API for GitHub. I would mentioned that earlier. And um, the API documentation is uh, essentially the secret decodering. How do I use this? And it gives you different areas that you need to look into and be concerned with. They aren't all going to be the same. Um, uh, this one is particularly well documented. It tells you what you need to worry about for the current version. Um, it lays out all of the data format schemas that are going to come back. Uh, you do need to know the schema for the JSON um, so that if you are writing an application, um, you know how to parse it. Uh, that's, that's quite important. Um, different parameters you can send, uh, what the endpoint's going to be. Uh, for GitHub, because it's such a big service, uh, they might have a, uh, a personal endpoint uh, given to you for um, being able to call an API rather than a uh, fully public service. Uh, client, a uh, client errors, what do you do when you get that information back? Um, one of the ones that's not in here, oh, yeah, it is. Um, towards the bottom there, we have uh, number eight, authentication. Um, that's usually the first hump that people have a really hard time getting over with using an API is, how do I actually get access to the service? Um, again, I will, I'm going to plug my other session about uh, API authentication and authorization, because I'll talk about different methods that you can do that. Um, but the very first thing, I actually don't know why it's not number one on their list, but I would put it as number one is, how do I actually access this API? Um, and then finally, I wanted to talk about uh, pagination. So there are servers doing work at the other that do something part in our API. So you have to worry about, um, or this, the first person providing the service has to worry about potentially millions of uh, calls in a very short amount of time hitting their service. So they need to be set up to provide that. Um, but they also need to provide the ability for the API calls to be rate limited or metered. Um, that ties back to the authorization. That's going to say, I'm this person or I'm this application, um, and I'm allowed to make 5,000 calls per second. Um, and the rate limiting portion of an API will then say, you know, it'll count that. And it'll say, okay, you've made 5,000 calls this second. You need to wait for another second to, to uh, make 5,000 more calls. Um, and then it might force you to paginate. So a lot of the APIs that I use um, only allow between 100 and 250 records to come back. And it depends on the service and how big it is and um, all of those things. But if you're getting a lot of data over HTTP, um, it, it, you know, it affects that service. It affects your service. And so when it talks about pagination, um, it's saying, I want the first 100 results you know, if I find what I need in that, that's great. But if I don't, then I'll make another API call to get the next 100 results in the second page. Make sense? OK, cool. Um, so now let's jump over to uh, Postman. And we are going to look at the API call for GitHub. Um, now, this one in particular doesn't require authorization, so we don't need to worry about all the parts and pieces. Um, in this tool, let me make it a little bigger, <laughs> the important portions of it are the method that you pick. Um, as you can see, there's a pattern to this. We've already talked about get, post, put, delete. Um, those are the ones that are important to us. Those are the ones that I've never used any of the other methods, so um, I actually can't speak intelligently as to what they would do. But uh, you know, our important ones are there. Um, in this instance, we're just going to be getting information, so we're going to leave that as a get. We have our URL. Um, this is our service, apigithub.com. Um, <clears throat> sometimes you notice that it has API in the URL. Sometimes the um, API service is a different service than the actual application, depending on how, uh, how they have it set up. Uh, and then in this uh, portion, the resource that's being provided to us is orgs. Cisco DevNet, that would be our variable um, repository. So you might have your own repository on, on GitHub. And if you wanted to know the, um, or you might have your own subset of repositories available on GitHub. And if you wanted to know what those repos were in that, you would then replace Cisco DevNet with uh, whatever your space is. So uh, we're going to hit send on that. Hopefully everything will work OK. And we get back JSON. So a uh, quick note about 
this REST client. There are a number of these types of tools available. They're all kind of set up in the same way. We like this one. It does some cool stuff. Um, but uh, this is a good way to try out APIs. Um, a lot of times, you'll start reading the documentation. Sometimes the documentation, and we'll see this with the Spark demo, um, will allow you to uh, run the API calls in the documentation. Um, that's useful for a little bit to kind of see how things are coming back and forth. Um, but then the next step in the process is to go into a REST client like this and try them out, um, see how di uh, changing different variables will cause uh, different data to come back. Uh, so these are, are quite useful in that instance. Um, so that's why we use them a lot to talk about our APIs. And then after you're kind of familiar with how the APIs are built, and how to use them and how the data comes back, then you can translate that into code. And actually, there's a very nice portion of this particular REST client that generates the code for you so to at least get you started in that instance. Um, so we got our, our information back. Uh, one of the important points is the status over here, 200 OK. It actually tells us um, a little bit of information about what 200 OK is. It tells us how quickly that call came back. This is a pretty quick service. Excuse me. Um, we have our headers. Uh, we don't usually care too much about what's in the headers that come back in the response, but they're there if you need them. And then the real important part is the body of um, the JSON that came back. So this is, these are all the repositories up to, I think, I don't know if they, if they limit how many come back, but we got a lot of data here. And I, want, <coughs> I wonder if they force pagination. All right, they don't. So this is literally every repository that is in, um, in GitHub under that Cisco DevNet moniker. Are there any questions about how I got to this point? Nope. Good? All right, great. So that's um, Postman running a very simple call. Things get a little more complicated after this, <laughs> but not too complicated. All right, I just talked about all of those things. Um, oh, let me put this in for you. <clears throat> so I'm going to actually walk through. Um, on this left part here, we have a, what's called a collection of API calls. Um, as you do these kind of things over and over again, you'll notice that there's a, a pattern to them. Um, so you start collecting them um, and, and putting them into a a repository of its own uh, so that you can recall them back. And because we do these classes over and over and over again, we dump them into a, um, a repository so we could do that. And I think I'm going to hit share here, collection link. I'm going to put this in the chat so you guys can grab that. And then what you do is copy it. You can click on it to see what's in it. It actually creates a, a little JSON as well. Um, I'll click on it just so you guys can see that. Um, but it's just information. Oh, it actually is smart enough to go do that. So if you want to import that into um, Postman, there's a little import button. You have a couple of different options, and the one you're going to want to do is import from link. And we pop that in, import. I already have the collection, so it's saying um, it already exists. So let's import that as a copy. And you see it just generates a new folder with, with those particular in, um, API calls in there. So if you're following along, hopefully we're in a place that you guys can actually run these as well. Um, Let's see, we have about 10 minutes, and then we're going to blow through this Spark demo because it's pretty cool. I like it. Um, so let's go over to Spark real quick and talk about documentation and how to understand what the APIs look like. <clears throat> For some reason, it takes me to Google Poland every time when I'm here. All right, so the first thing we need to do is go to developer.ciscospark.com. And again, let me put that in the chat. Um, go ahead and log into that if you want to follow along. I'm already logged in with one of my test accounts. Um, 
the documentation is under documentation. And we're going to look at, um, um, you feel free to peruse the documentation on, on your own time. Uh, but the one that we're going to be looking at right now is the Rooms API. So let's over, head over to that. One second. So um, you'll notice in the documentation, it gives us all the uh, potential API calls that we have available to us to um, manage rooms, get information about rooms, uh, so we can get rooms, which is going to give us a list of the rooms that we are um, members of. And it's only that you only have access to the information that you are a member of. Um, it's not like I can go and make the request and see a list of in, uh, rooms that Paul is a member of. Um, it's only, you only have access to your own data in that situation. Um, <clears throat> post, you can create a room through the API. Um, we do that for some of our chatbots. Um, we can get room details if you need them. You can do different things with the room ID. Um, if you want to change the name, for example, of a, of a room um, through the API, you would use that put call. And then finally, if you want to cache a room out, you would hit delete. Um, so we're going to take a look at the get rooms API. In the upper right corner, um, this is kind of important so you know how to test the API. Uh, you're going to want to click on test mode. Um, and then kind of everything we saw in the Postman client we see here. We don't have to type anything in. It fills it all in for us. Uh, the content type, uh, we're, gonna, um, we're asking for JSON back. I don't think it allows us to ask for anything else. This one only supports JSON. Um, and then the other portion is we have this authorization token. Now what Spark does, and what I will go through in the um, authorization class, is it leverages uh, OAuth. And so it generates, the OAuth process generates a token that allows you to, to um, make the API calls. And it, it says this person or this application is valid um, and is allowed to make certain API calls. Uh, while you're going through the documentation, it's already filled in for you. And that is because um, Spark provides you with uh, a developer token. And if you click on your face in the upper right corner, um, you can grab that access token if you are um, going to be working with the APIs. And I'll show how that translates to um, using it in the REST client. But real quick, we are going to take a look at what happens if we run this API in the documentation. Now, if I wanted to, I could put a team ID in there. Or if I only wanted to see 10 rooms, I would put max 10. Um, I can't remember what goes in type right now, so I'm not going to talk about that. Um, but you can see that there are different query parameters that are available to us. And actually, um, I know this person is in three rooms, so this should be OK. Click Run. And let's see here. Should have ran. Oh, there we go. Oh, because I have it blown up, it does it below. Um, if you have it properly sized on your screen, it'll do it off to the right-hand side. Uh, but it's a 200 success. It kind of simplifies the stuff that we had seen in the Postman client. But again, um, this is trying to uh, just to get you familiar with um, what the API is, how to form that. You'll notice that it doesn't really give us the request uh, URL. Uh, but I now can see the response, um, the rooms that, I'm, that this particular user is in, uh, and information about them. OK? Now let's kick that over and do the same thing in Postman. Um, in our list of Spark rooms, or in our collection of APIs, we have a list of Spark rooms. Um, the endpoint is api.ciscospark.com slash v1 rooms. And just to get that in the chat, you can do that. Make sure you have it, this set to get. Um, we don't actually need to explicitly talk about the content type in the headers. You can if you need to, but you don't have to. Um, it'll assume content type is JSON. Uh, the thing that we do need to do, though, however, is fill out the authorization um, and then put in the word bearer with a space afterwards. And then this portion is that, that developer token that I talked about earlier. And again, where you get that is from... Uh, Back in, the docu or back in the documentation in developer.ciscospark.com, if you click on your face, um, it'll give you the 
what your access token is, you copy that, and then you pop that into Postman uh, right here. Now, this is a pretty simple call. We're just getting a list. We're not doing anything fancy. So I'm going to just hit send so you guys see that happen. Came back really quickly, got all of our information back, and uh, we're good to go. Any questions there? Oh, thank you. <laughs> I have five minutes. Um, so that's good. So now let's actually do something cool and create a Spark Room with, through the API. So let's go over that. So you'll notice that the endpoint's the same. Um, but now because we're changing the method to post rather than get, the API knows to do something differently. And we don't have to have separate endpoints to leverage that API, even though they're different methods. So it stays the same. That's nice. Some APIs will do it differently. Um, like I'm using an API, or CMX uses an API where um, if you want to get the list of notification subscriptions back, it says notifications. But if you want to create one, it uses notification. But that's in the documentation, so it's not that big of a deal. Um, but some APIs are a little more clever and keep the same endpoints. Um, so anyways, we're going to do a post. Now in this instance, our authorization is, header is there, and it's going to be the same as what we expected before. Um, but the content type does have to be set, because we have to tell the API that I'm now sending you JSON data. So if you're doing a post, you have to send content to the API to make sure that you're actually getting that record. And if you're not sending anything, you're not doing anything, it's kind of useless. So, <clears throat> um, so we have to make sure that content type is set. The way that you set that, you can either uh, put it in there or not, is to set the body for the call. And so um, this is what came back. Let's see here. Uh, body. So all you need to send in for uh, creating a room is a title. Um, I know this from the documentation. I'm not going to waste time jumping back and forth. But I know that through the documentation, testing it out in the documentation, that I need to format my JSON to look like this, that it will accept title. It won't accept name. Um, it has to be formatted in this way. And um, in the Postman client, and this is usually one of the biggest stumbling blocks people have when they're playing with uh, APIs, is they forget to click on raw. And then you have different um, format types. And you choose the one that the API um, in the documentation tells you that it can accept. In this instance, I know that it accepts JSON. So I'm going to set it to that. And that'll actually do you a nice favor and set that content type header. Then you don't have to worry about doing it yourself. Um, so I'll just change it real quick so you can see. So if I go to that, um, it changes it to text, takes that content type away because it's assuming that um, I don't have to tell it explicitly that I'm going to get text back. But I need to set it to JSON, so it's going to add that header back in for me. So we saw that go back and forth. Oh, it, that is not good. That is not right. JSON. There we go. OK, application JSON. So I'm going to create a room. Um, let's go back to body. We'll do Matlow's Berlin 2. We're going to send that. If everything goes well, hooray, we get a response back, 200 OK. Sometimes you might get a 201 created, depending on the API. And I get back a room ID. And I can grab that ID. And if I look in Spark, so I would initially done one to make sure that it worked. Um, if I look in Spark, I see that uh, we can't make Spark bigger. That's annoying. Um, I see that I've now created a room, Matt Lowe's Berlin 2, and I'm in that room now. Now, if I wanted to add um, a person to that particular room, I could add a person to the room. And again, this is all, all the formatting and stuff is coming from the documentation. I need to change the room ID because I know that this is not the one that I need to set up. So, and just so you guys can see that I'm not that this is all happening on the fly. You can look at the room, and if you look at people, the only person in there is my test user, Darla. Um, and so I should be able to add myself into that room. All right, let's see. Everything says I'm OK. That's good. It went into the service, got my name. And if I go back into the service, I see I now show up in there. So I'm able to 
um, add people to the room through the API as well. Um, and this might be something, uh, going back to that DevOps uh, example, uh, you're setting up a new repository in GitHub, you have everyone on your team, you want to do a quick application that adds people to a Spark room so you can collaborate on that, on that product. Um, you take the team names and you kick them all into a room through the API. Um, <clears throat> so we have that. I have about 30 seconds left. I'm going to see if there's anything else. So the other options are to delete a room. Um, I'm not going to, yeah, you know what? Let's just run it. Uh, we put in the room ID. Um, it's not, it, so that's where we passed in the endpoint. It's not a parameter value. It's a resource in this instance. Um, again, the documentation tells us that's the case. It could have just as easily have been a query parameter, depending on how the API was designed. It was a choice made when this product was built. And so we send that. 204 no content. Let's see if that worked. I might have uh, misformatted. Oh, remove from the space. And that room's gone. Matlow's Berlin 2 is, is, out of the, is, out of the, uh, is out of there. So that's walking through those. Um, let me make sure I covered everything so you guys don't get shortchanged. Did all that stuff. I talked about REST authentication. All right, that's it. And that was spot on, 9.45. OK, cool. Are the, before we uh, finish, are there any questions? No? OK, excellent. Uh, one quick admin note. Um, around the DevNet zone, we have all of these sessions. Uh, this is classroom three, um, even though it's been the theater in the, in the past. Uh, class, classrooms one and two are over there. If you're looking for them, we have our workbenches uh, split out here, all of the demo pods. Anything you do in the DevNet zone. Um, we have a, a Spark bot named Devi. Um, and there are instructions on the, on the stanchions there that say DevNet zone challenge. I implore you to do that because that earns you credit to then get some cool stuff that we give away. So uh, please feel free, download Spark, and, and then follow the instructions for that. Thank you, guys. I appreciate it. Thanks for your time.